Oh boy. Seven days to die. This video might be five minutes long, honestly. So, for context, if you aren't aware, Seven Days to Die on console, at least, uh, is a very unfinished game. Uh, it was pretty much abandoned by the developers. I think Telltale bought it, um, and then obviously Telltale went under. Um, and now it's kind of just in limbo on console. However, on PC, the game's very much alive and kicking. So it isn't perfect on PC either. I have seen gameplay. Um, but the state of Seven Days on PC is in a much better state than the console version. So I obviously play on an Xbox Series X, so I'm only going to be talking about the console version. The gameplay in Seven Days to Die is mediocre at best. And at worst, I'd say it's downright awful. So the game is a survival game, uh, obviously with zombies. And it has all the cliche elements of a survival game. You cut down trees for wood, you mine stone for stone and iron, um, and coal as well. You dig uh, like clay for clay and for sand um, to make glass and other uh, materials. You destroy plants for plant fibers to make um, tools, plant fiber clothing, etc. You get you get the idea. It's, it's a survival game. Um, so resource harvesting, pretty standard, nothing to really criticise, does nothing different, does nothing wrong, it's just the same as we've always been. Uh, you have a food and a water bar, you need to maintain both of these to survive, um, as well as temperature as well. If you get too hot, you'll dehydrate faster. If you get too cold, um, you can die from hypothermia. And as much as I'd like to praise this mechanic for making the game more in-depth, Getting too cold only really happens if you're in a snowy biome, which is usually rare because making a base in a snow biome usually isn't a good idea anyway. And getting too hot is usually a quick fix of literally taking all your clothes off or taking shelter in a building and just standing there for five minutes on the menu watching your temperature tick back down to about 85, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So while that survival element is definitely there, as, long, as well as the uh, food and hunger and uh, thirst, they aren't anything crazy. Um, it's the same basic stuff, really. Now, base building in this game is pretty good. Um, in seven days, you can either start a base from complete scratch, or you can take over an existing building and turn it into home. So the choice is yours. Each has advantages and disadvantages. Taking over an existing building means you can just upgrade it and not have to build anything from scratch. The downside is that you have to utilize whatever space you have and you have to work around the existing building. Uh, this is the opposite for building a base from scratch. Building a completely new base means you have full control over the size, how it looks, the defenses, etc. So the downside of this method is that you'll need to gather far more resources just to get the basic framework of the base up and running, let alone upgrading all of your walls and doors. Moving on from the base building aspect, we have the crafting. And the crafting in this game is pretty much just like any other survival game. You gather whatever resources you need to craft the item you want. Um, one thing the crafting does that I'm not too keen on personally is that items take in real life time to be crafted. So if you craft 100 wooden spikes, um, uh, that can take up to 40 minutes. So if you're in the middle of building your base and you want to place spikes all around your walls, you go to craft 100 spikes and you see a 40 minute timer. You, know, you, you need to go do something else now for 40 minutes. It's not a terrible mechanic, because you can just go and get more resources, or build another part of the base, or plant some zombies, or animals. Um, it's just personally, I look at it as just an inconvenience. And another thing that the crafting in this game does is lock some items away from the player. These items are usually unlocked in one of two ways. So the first way is to read blueprints or schematics um, and weapon magazines to learn how to craft them. So all the guns in the game have a magazine or schematic linked to them. Uh, the mini bike has a schematic. Most armor in the game can have a schematic. And the second way to unlock crafting recipes is through specific skills that you unlock by leveling up and using your skill points to purchase. So if you want to craft steel ingots, which are needed for the best items in the game, you need to save up the skill points to learn how to make them. Uh, this mechanic I find less tiresome than the crafting timer. Although sometimes the RNG of finding certain schematics can be really frustrating. Um, like sometimes you won't find a mini bike magazine for about 20 in-game days. And other times you can find a shotgun magazine within two days. 
So it's very much luck based, which can be good or bad depending on how you how hard you like your survival games to be. Moving on from the crafting, we have the combat. There's close range melee weapons and then there's ranged weapons like guns, crossbows and bows. Bows can be crafted pretty immediately after starting a new game, but are pretty rubbish. Uh, their accuracy is usually pretty bad and the damage they deal isn't great from long range either and they're honestly just kind of crap. Crossbows I can't speak for because I've never actually managed to come across one when I've been playing the game, but I imagine they'd be a lot better than the bow. Um, we have a guns, of which there are the following. The pistol, the submachine gun, the assault rifle, a hunting rifle, a revolver, a shotgun, a short shotgun, a blunderbuss, a sniper rifle, and a rocket launcher. Now, these are all of the guns in the console version, as far as I'm aware. I do know that on the PC version there's like an M60 machine gun, but that isn't on console. Um, I've only ever used a pistol, an SMG, a shotgun, a blunderbuss, an assault rifle, and I also used a hunting rifle literally the night before I'm recording this video. Um, but for the rest of the guns, unfortunately I can't speak on them, because I've never used them. So the pistol is pretty basic, doesn't do a lot of body damage, so you should use it for headshots. Uh, the SMG is good for spewing out a lot of bullets quickly, but this wears ammo really quickly as well, so it usually isn't worth it. And also, it has a tendency to kind of break the game of how fast it's trying to render the fired bullets and can actually make your game crash. Um, the shotgun's pretty decent, but is only really viable at close range. The blunderbuss is a poor man's shotgun, um, and it's only really useful at really, in, like, extremely close range. Um, the assault rifle is better at longer ranges, but I would honestly just use it in short bursts rather than just unloading all your ammo, which usually is the tendency for most ranged weapons in other games as well. In terms of melee weapons, we have clubs, knives, a sledgehammer, and a fire axe. So there are a few variations of clubs. You have a wooden club, a spiked club, a barbed club, and an iron reinforced club. The wooden club is the melee version of the bow. You can craft it very early on, but it's rather weak and breaks easily. The other types of clubs are much better, um, as the spiked and barbed clubs can cause bleeding damage, as well as stun damage, and the iron reinforced club will break less easily. In terms of knives, you've got a hunting knife, which you need a schematic to craft, or a bone shiv, which can be crafted from one large bone. Now, there is, I think, a machete in the console version as well, I'm, I don't think I've ever come across one, but I think there is a machete in the, cro in the console version. But because I've never come across one, I can't really say how good... I imagine it would be great, but I, I'm not sure. So, the bone shiver is a good tool early on for getting more meat from animals, um, but it isn't great as a weapon. And the hunting knife, on the other hand, is very effective. It deals decent damage, and if you aim at a zombie's head, it can stun them, sending them tumbling to the ground, making them a lot easier to deal with. The fire axe is good for dismembering zombies, but is listed under mining tools rather than weapons, as it is meant for chopping down trees, but can be used as weapons if uh, absolutely necessary. The sledgehammer is a great weapon, as it deals stun damage to enemies, meaning they're very easy to dispatch of, and at the moment, me and my girlfriend are trying to hit 1000 score in one game for an achievement, and the main weapon we are both using at the moment is hunting knives. They're really easy to craft, they deal decent damage. Next, we have the skill tree. Or the skill menu. Or the skill list. I don't know. Call it whatever you want. I think it's a skill menu. In Seven Days Today, you level up by playing the game. By scavenging for supplies, you level up your scavenging skill. By using bladed weapons, you level up your bladed weapon skill. Some examples include the survivor, uh, which makes you hungry less quickly. Uh, the camel, which slows dehydration. So these are skills that you kind of have to purchase. Um, and then other skills again before you purchase them require another skill to be a certain level so a good example is there's a skill called knife guy which increases your blade weapon damage and decreases the amount of stamina you use to attack using bladed weapons however you first need to have your bladed weapon skill at level 10 before by purchasing the first level of knife guy when you upgrade the knife guy to level 1 you then increase the level of bladed weapons you need to upgrade it again. So, bladed weapons for the first level of knife guy needs to be level 10. Then when you want knife guy level 2, your bladed weapons need to be at level 20. Then at level 40. And then I think the last one's like 60. 
So that's the game's way of not allowing you to just spam all your skin points into like the really powerful skills immediately. You actually have to like kind of work for them. And I hope that made sense because having knife guy and bladed weapons in one sentence gets confusing. Finally, rounding off the gameplay section, we have uh, the enemies and the blood moons. There are a variety of zombies in the game, although most of them I don't think I've ever come across. There are normal zombies, that are your stereotypical zombies. You also have screamers that make a lot of noise and draw in more zombies. There are also spider zombies that in the day you just crawl on all fours slowly, but at night they sprint and can climb over your base walls. There are also burnt zombies in a certain biome that are on fire and can set the player alight if they hit you. There are also lumberjack zombies, usually found in the snow biome. These zombies are slower, but they have more health, deal more damage, and can stun the player as well as cause bleeding. Um, there are demolishers, who are like terrifying, I've been told. You also have infected policemen zombies that can spit acid at long distances. Once they have low health, they will run at the player trying to explode and take the player with them. This explosion is almost always lethal for the player. Demolishers are highly armoured zombies that can appear in later game Blood Moon hordes. They can easily destroy spikes and defences. And also included in the game are zombie dogs and zombie bears. Zombie dogs are very fast and can cause a lot of damage quickly, especially if they're in a pack. Zombie bears are usually by themselves, but they can cause major damage to the player quite easily killing you. Now, Blood Moons are kind of how the game has its name. Every 7 days, at 10pm, the moon and the sky will turn red, and a huge horde of zombies will hunt the player until 4am. You can't hide from these enemies they, as they track you down. Being outside of your base during a blood moon is usually certain death. Being inside becomes a fight for survival as you defend your base, making sure no walls go down and repairing defences when you need to. Once the blood moon is over, the horde will not despawn, but will gradually lose interest in the player, although they won't wander far. So you will still need to kill the zombies. Blood Moons are definitely one of the few good things Seven Days has going for it. They're terrifying, and I always dread when the next week is up and zombie shrieks fill the air. Blood Moons also become increasingly harder as each one passes, with bigger hordes and much stronger zombies. Seven Days to Die has a few setting choices that allow you to tweak the game world to your liking. To start with, there are two options before starting a new game. You can either play in a randomly generated world, or you can play on the tutorial world known as Navsgain. Navsgain is a preset world that will be exactly the same every time you play it. Having this option is good, because this allows newer players to get a feel for the game as well as learn the map, knowing what buildings hold what type of supplies, how the different biomes work. And then having a randomly generated option is also good, because this allows veteran players to have a bit more of a challenge. Not knowing where things are makes the game a lot harder. There are also other options, such as how long in-game days are, how often supply drops can occur, how frequently buildings and their loot will regenerate. You can even turn zombies off altogether for a much more laid-back experience. You can also change the durability of blocks, making them faster or slower to be destroyed. This affects both the player and the zombies. Seven Days to Die also has a creative mode, much like Minecraft, where you can just build whatever you want. Of course, achievements are locked in this mode, so for someone like myself, this isn't something I'd find useful. Before I forget, did I mention there's also a character select screen? You can choose from a variety of characters who are all named and have their own outfits, though this ultimately doesn't matter because you don't get those outfits in-game and the characters don't speak either, so this is relatively pointless. There isn't a lot to say about the graphics or sound design in this game. The graphics are definitely underwhelming. Um, the game looks terrible. It sometimes stutters or freezes up. Lag is also quite common. Uh, the lighting also isn't brilliant. I had to ramp my brightness up to maximum because at night I couldn't see shit. And I know some people in the comments will say stuff like, well, that's how night works. You should struggle to see. And my guy, when I say it's dark, I mean you could wave your hand in front of my face and I wouldn't see shit. Uh, the sound design isn't much better, but it's not awful. Zombies sound how zombies should, as well as the infected animals. Um, screamer zombies sound terrifying as well. However, passive animals like deer, pigs or chickens make no sound at all unless attacked. Um, and they also look... The deers, anyway, look ridiculous when they run away from the player. I mean, yeah. 
So in short, the graphics are terrible, but the sound design is serviceable. Before I get to the achievements, I just wanted to add in this quick section about bugs or glitches. So, Seven Days to Die is obviously not a finished product. Realistically speaking, this shouldn't even be on the Xbox Store in the first place. This game was like, at the time that I had it, it was like £25, which, you know, that's not great for a game that's like basically not finished. So, I've never encountered any bugs other than one game crashing, my game crashing from time to time, but there is one bug both me and my girlfriend have experienced that can basically kill your entire playthrough. What happens is this. You'll be playing the game as normal, the screen starts to flicker, and then the game crashes. You think nothing of it, you load the game back up, and then you load your save, and all or half of your base is gone, your chests and their items are gone, the building you set up in has reset to its default state, and this is a known bug in the game that cannot be fixed once it occurs. This literally kills your save completely, and the likelihood of it getting fixed is very, very slim. Right, so the achievements in this game are fucking horrible. I'm serious. I'm dreading trying to do these, and it's not because they're hard, it's because they're insanely tedious. So most of the achievements in seven days are the same, but with different numbers. So an example would be kill 10 zombies, then kill 100 zombies, then 500 zombies, then kill 2,500 zombies. There are some achievements that aren't too bad, such as placing your first bedroll or bandaging a bleeding wound. And the secret achievements aren't too hard either, excluding one which is semi-luck based. The problem I have with this game's achievements is just asking why. Why do I need to kill 2,500 zombies? Why do I need to kill 2,500 other players, even though the maximum players you can have in one game is four? Why do I need to travel 1,000 kilometers when the map isn't even that big? The big issue is that most players just aren't going to play for this length of time. A lot of players aren't going to play PvP. A lot of players aren't going to get to 200 wellness because the grind to do so sucks. A lot of players aren't going to survive on a solo world for 1,250 minutes without dying once because it's horrible. I understand that achievements are meant to be challenging and gratifying to complete and are a way to keep people playing your game. But all or any of these achievements do for me is make me want to put the game down. I look at the insane numbers required for each of them and I just sigh. Mix that with a buggy, choppy mess of a game and it's even less appealing to try going for that 100%. Am I still going to do it? Yes, because I'm stubborn and I want the 100%, but your average player, they're just not gonna bother. They're just gonna, they're just gonna look at this game and go, yeah, no, I've had my three hours of fun, that's it, never gonna touch this again. I'd honestly say the top three worst achievements in this game by far are as follows. Survivalist, score 1,000 in one game. Then you have the picture of good health, hit 200 wellness. And the final one is, Nearly immortal, 1,250 minutes lived in single player. Most of the other achievements are just as tedious, um, but with these three in particular, you really can't afford to die, which makes them doubly awful. The easiest achievement is probably good in the sack, place your first bedroll, or because he's the axe man, crafted your first stone axe. These are both unlocked pretty much as soon as you start your first save of the game. Now, before I end this video, uh, I wanted to chuck in this small section about the game possibly getting the support that it needs. In its current state, I honestly would not recommend this game to anyone. The game is a buggy, stuttering mess with game wiping glitches that can kill an entire playthrough in one crash. The gameplay is mediocre at best, the graphics are poor, the sound design is meh. However, there is a glimmer of hope for console players. On the 29th of September this year, the official Seven Days to Die Twitter posted an update to fans of the game, stating that they do in fact have a team working on the console edition of the game, however they have no real news to share about the console update. So there is a possibility that Seven Days could reach the same potential as its PC counterpart, and the experience would be so much improved. So if you're a glass half full kind of person, then you could pick up the game and then wait for this console update to come out. 
um, and hope that over time the game is able to hit the same level as it has on PC. If you're not a glass half full person, then I'd say just don't pick up the game until you see hard evidence that it's been fixed, improved and is getting active support. While Seven Days to Die may be very active on PC, with support and updates constantly being rolled out, and the same cannot be said for the console edition. Poor gameplay, graphics mixed with average sound design and game-breaking bugs make for a poor experience. Throw in some outright horrible achievements that no sane person would ever go to the trouble of unlocking, and you've got a truly miserable experience. Seven Days to Die. Maybe the game should do just that and die already.